Next, we're going to examine the piston components. Those components consist of the gas block, which is secured by two straight pins, which should not be removed except by a gunsmith or armorer. The gas plug, the drive rod, the drive rod spring and bushing, and all of those parts we'll examine in just a moment. When viewing the gas plug and the front of the gas block, you'll notice a spring-loaded detent button located at the 12 o'clock position of the gas plug. By pressing this button, we can now rotate the gas plug either clockwise or counterclockwise. Rotating it accomplishes different things. When the detent button is in the 12 o'clock position, this is for normal operation and firing with standard ammunition without the use of a, a suppressor. If we rotate it clockwise to the 1 o'clock position, and again, hearing that click for every position, we are now in suppressed shooting mode. This mode should only be used when a sound suppressor is affixed to the front of the rifle. Sound suppressors are subject to local and state laws and vary by jurisdiction. Continuing to rotate the gas plug clockwise to the 3 o'clock position is now single shot suppressed shooting. The gas system is now off and the piston will not cycle, meaning you essentially have a single shot rifle until you charge it manually. Rotating it back to the 12 o'clock position and again hearing that click and watching the button snap into place, we are now in normal shooting mode. This is where the selector should be for normal shooting. To remove the piston components, press on the detent button and rotate counterclockwise to the 9 o'clock position. Once here, we can then pull forward, removing the gas plug, drive rod, drive rod spring and bushing. This is the piston component system. The gas plug separates from the drive rod. The gas plug can then be brushed off with some light solvent and a brush to clean, as can the drive rod drive rod spring, and bushing. If for some reason the spring becomes separated from the drive rod or the drive rod bushing, they simply press into place. The spring, either side, will press into the bushing until you feel a click and the two come together. And the spring and bushing simply slide onto the drive rod and click and compress in place. This assembly can simply be cleaned as well with just a light solvent and brushing. The inside of the gas block can also become dirty after firing. To clean this, a round brush or a cylinder brush such as this makes for cleaning very easy. Once cleaned, the piston components can then be reassembled by inserting the gas plug into the drive rod and the whole assembly through the gas block, lining it up with the barrel nut watching the drive rod extend through the delta ring and into the upper receiver. We can then rotate it to the 9 o'clock position, press the detent, and rotate it back to the 12 o'clock position for normal firing. Now that we've taken apart and reassembled our bolt carrier assembly, as well as piston components, we can put the upper receiver assembly back together. We'll take the charging handle and insert it into a large portion of the receiver, again sliding it up and back into the track, and it helps to turn it upside down with some of the charging handle extended outward. We can then set the strike surface into the channel of the charging handle, sliding the entire assembly then forward until we hear a click. That click was just the dust cover opening and the bolt going to the forward position. You'll notice because of the bolt spring, there is slight rearward pressure. We'll address that when we reassemble the two halves. We can close the dust cover and we can reassemble our upper and lower receiver assemblies. To do that, we simply align them, set them in place, press rearward with the upper receiver, compressing that bolt spring tension, and we can then close both the front and rear pivot pins. Next, we're going to talk about lubrication. Because this is a machine, lubrication is vital for its function. So we're going to talk about where to lube how to lube, and what to lube with. First, what to lube with. We want to use a quality oil that's designed for firearms. We want to use an oil that has some slight thickness to it. We don't want to use a thin penetrating type oil. We want the oil to be, have some properties where it will remain on the surface lubricated. 
I particularly use a needle oiler because it's easy to apply my oil exactly where I want the lubrication to be. Next, let's talk about where to lubricate. On the lower receiver, we just simply want to clean out the fire control group. We can use a swab, we can use uh, maybe a small rag to get in there, things like that, and we want to clean off the buffer and recoil spring. We never want to lubricate the buffer and recoil spring as we don't want to create oil there that can attract dirt and create mud. Lubrication of the lower receiver is very sparingly. We're just simply going to take our oil and you'll notice coils of the hammer and trigger spring. We simply put one drop on each of the coils as shown. We can also put the rifle on the fire position holding the hammer, press the trigger to prevent the hammer from falling forward. Again, we don't want to dry fire, we could cause damage. Here, on the back bottom portion of the hammer, you'll notice a contact surface. If you want to, you can put a very, very, very small drop of lubrication there as well. We can then re-engage the hammer by simply pushing it down rearward, cocking it, allowing us to then place our selector in the safe position. That's all the lubrication that's needed in the lower receiver. Lubrication for the upper receiver. I'll put a small drop of lubricant on my finger, smear it around, and then put a very, very light coating on the drive rod and gas plug. We don't want to excessively lubricate these parts. In essence, this is just to help in aiding and cleaning next time as some of the dirt, powder, etc. will wipe off a little easier. We're not actually trying to lubricate these parts per se as they move freely on their own. This is just to aid in cleaning and prevent corrosion. However, corrosion is really not an issue with our melanite coating process. We'll then reassemble the piston components. We want to lubricate the charging handle. Again, it's normal to see friction or contact wear. So we're just going to take a few drops of lubricant and we're going to spread this over the charging handle. If you don't feel comfortable using your finger, you can either use a glove or you can use a swab. We want a good amount of glaze. Again, we don't want necessarily it dripping, but a sufficient glaze is adequate for the charging handle. For the carrier, we want to lubricate the bolt lugs, which are these teeth on the front of the bolt. A small drop on each lug, a small drop that we can spread around the surface of the bolt, and we can spread that by simply compressing the bolt in and out. This will help spread that lubrication over the surface of the bolt and the inside surface of the carrier. We then want to lubricate the carrier bearing surfaces. We can just simply take a drop on the bearing surfaces. and You might see some friction marks here after use, perfectly normal, and we'll just spread this around. Personally, I take a drop and I just spread it around the carrier with my finger, or again, you can use a glove, a swab, and I just like to have a nice glaze on the carrier. Once we have the carrier lubricated, including the bolt and the ex uh, exterior of the carrier, we can reassemble the charging handle and the bolt carrier assembly into the upper receiver. Now that we have our lower receiver lubricated and our upper receiver lubricated, we can reassemble. What I like to do next is take an oily rag and simply wipe down the exterior of the rifle. A light lubricant is okay for this application. We can simply either spray or put that on the rag and then start wiping down all of the metal surfaces. I do not recommend wiping down the handguard or the pistol grip or the stock. Those are generally areas that we want to have some friction or contact with our hands. This lubrication is just to assist in any corrosion resistance. For optimum operation and performance of your rifle, you want to make sure you select quality ammunition and quality magazines. Quality magazines include the USGI or aluminum style magazine that came with your rifle or aftermarket magazines such as this polymer magazine by Magpul. The model is a P-Mag. These are both available at Mills Fleet Farm. Proper magazines is what feeds your rifle the ammunition. This is a very important component of your firearm. If your magazine becomes damaged, replace it. Magazines are considered an expendable or disposable item. Once they become damaged, you generally cannot repair them. And again, this is what feeds the rifle. It's very important to have good running magazines. After you've selected a quality magazine, it's important to select quality ammunition. Why buy a very nice rifle such as a Holdridge series and use very inexpensive imported ammunition? Quality ammunition such as brass-cased ammunition from Federal, 
Winchester, PMC, Remington, and several other quality brands is what's going to operate the best in this rifle. We want to make sure your ammunition is either chambered in 223 Remington or 5.56 NATO. The chamber of this rifle is a 5.56 chamber, meaning that you can shoot either 5.56 ammunition or 223 ammunition. Again, use quality ammunition for optimum performance. Your rifle or upper out of the box does not come with sights. We did this because many users choose a sight system that works best for them. So rather than put a sight system that they would remove, our theory is we'd rather give you the money, keep that money in your pocket so you can purchase the sight system of your choosing. Mills Fleet Farm offers several sight options as we've highlighted in other videos. Those sight options include iron sight, such as a carry handle and a fixed front sight. We also offer flip-up style sights or a variety of optics from scopes to red dots such as this. When installing your sights or optic, make sure that when you install the optic, sight, whatever it may be, on the universal rail or the gas block, that we press the optic, rail, sight, whatever it might be, down and we go forward. We press it forward. It's important to have the lugs of the sight, scope base, whatever it might be, on the forward part here because as the rifle recoils back, we don't want there to be a gap. So we want to simply press it down, press it forward, and then we can tighten per torque. We hope you found this video informative and as a resource for future questions that you may have. As always, if you do have any questions, you can feel free to contact our tech support via our webpage, which is www.holdraarms.com. You can also find us on Facebook, facebook.com slash holdraarms. And be sure to check out our many other videos on our YouTube channel. You can subscribe with the button right up there. Be sure to check out our discussion pages on the popular forums m4carbine.net and ar15.com. As always, when you shoot, shoot safe, wear your eye and ear protection. We thank you for your support, and if there's anything we can be of assistance, don't hesitate to contact us. Thank you very much, and have a great day.